Okay. Fantastic. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I really hope you had a fantastic time watching. I like movies. Um, in a second here, uh, we're at, we're going to be, well, we are joined by, and we're really thrilled and honored to be joined by writer, director, and producer Chandler Levesque. So let's give it up for her. There you go. All right. Awesome. Um, so Chandler, we're, we're here in Boston. I feel like we all just went through probably a very emotional journey together because... <laughs> I feel like even for someone like myself who has seen this movie before doing programming and all of that for the festival, it just, there's so, it's, there's so much going on emotionally. It's, I was saying in my introduction, there's so much that's, you know, like cringeworthy about what people do in the film, but then it kind of rips your heart out and it's funny. And like, I, I, I know this being your directorial debut, like, and I believe you spent five years working on this. What was that journey like? And, you know, like trying to balance all those emotions and during that, during the process, you know, from the beginning to now here, what were there things that you were initially really interested in exploring that kind of evolved into other things or things that kind of got left by the wayside? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm I'm really honored to, to be uh, part of this festival. And it's so cool that it's screening in Boston. I wish I was, was there tonight with you all. Um, I'm, I'm in Toronto right now where, where I'm from. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I always say that that, you know, it was a five year journey. I feel like the movie kind of took up the first half of my my 30s. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, it kind of represents like, uh, yeah, so much, so much of it is very um, autobiographical, maybe more than I would even care to uh, admit. And, um, you know, it, it, there's so many talented collaborators that, you know, I got to got to work with on this. And yeah, I think films are always shifting from kind of what you imagine on the page to what you actually create and then how you kind of find it in the edit. But I think with this one, um, I really just tried to kind of recreate as much as possible kind of my adolescence and my formative years working at Blockbuster in high school and sort of honor my extremely lame teen <laughs> experience. And I guess it was very uh, kind of gratifying to know that because this film was so personal and just specific to me um, entirely, like it's had this whole life, you know, um, that, that I could have never imagined. And that's been really, really, uh, I'm just so grateful for that. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting because this film has traveled all over the world. Um, you know, it's like been in, well, obviously it's, you know, a Canadian film. So, you know, it is not an American film. It, it started in Canada and came over here and it's been, in, you know, like Taiwan and Japan and Norway and all these things. And it's, in certain aspects, a very Canadian story, but also very <laughs> universal. Um, so I was wondering, like, what has the response been kind of as you take it to different cultures? And like, what are there certain things that other cultures kind of click with, depending on where you're at? Yeah, I mean, I was so uh, interested in that because, you know, we had our international premiere in, in Taiwan and uh a year ago exactly um now and um i remember thinking like how what the hell are people how are people in taiwan even gonna what are they gonna even think of this like they're not gonna know any of the the references like i don't i don't even know like if they're gonna connect to this like and then it was amazing i mean the screening like people coming up to me being like i am like lawrence i've seen it three times i'm coming back tomorrow and i was like this is crazy um yeah and then we've, we've shown it since then in in Norway and, and Ar Argentina and uh you know different parts of the U.S. too like Cleveland and um, Santa Barbara and uh yeah it is it is incredible to know that um I guess the more specific you are about your own experiences I guess that's what helps people makes it universal yeah and on that I I'm very interested in that whole process you're saying this film is you know, autobiographical or semi-autobiographical, like, what was that process like, kind of digging into the, 
embarrassing, cringy aspects of, you know, we, we all share, I feel like we all probably share those experiences of looking back and being like, oh God, like, why did I, I, I feel like Facebook memories are like the worst thing amongst, amongst oh, all the yeah. things that social media has, Facebook memories are probably like the worst. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh my God, why did I say that about like Star Trek into darkness? And I said, it was like the greatest movie ever made. And like, <laughs> it's like, yeah. So like, I, I'd love to hear about kind of that process and what that experience was like for you yeah well I guess while I was in pre-production you know we shot this film in like the height of the third wave of the pandemic in um the spring of 2021 um before there were vaccines or anything so during the pandemic I actually like moved back in with my dad to Burlington which is the town that I grew up in where this movie is set it's kind of a suburb of Toronto and so I felt like I was already like regressing into my 16 year old self uh, during the pandemic anyways. But then, yeah, I felt like the whole process of like making this film, like uh, was kind of like going back into my childhood and kind of like, you know, I found all my old mini TV tapes and I like rewatched the movies that I made in high school, which was incredibly, incredibly embarrassing and, and super cringeworthy. And, you know, my like, high school yearbook is like the yearbook that Lawrence signs at the end and the video mm. camera that he shoots with was like the video camera that I shot movies at on on high in high school my dad had to like find it because he lent it to like his tailor who lent it to his daughter you know mm. so it's this like weird process of having to like you know just like do all this kind of detective work and kind of recreate these memories of your past and kind of look for like special artifacts and and then also be on Facebook being like who has a pt cruiser i need one um <laughs> but i guess i'm such a anal retentive like detail oriented kind of filmmaker like the pleasure to me is always in the specificity of like little visual details and props and kind of how much world building you can do with like costumes and production design and stuff so mm -hmm. i just wanted to make it kind of very like southern ontario core and really memorialize like the early 2000s and um yeah I'm just a very nostalgic person so I think it was great I felt like I was kind of reconciling you know this whole film is kind of me in my my 30 year old self who I guess the sort of Alana character embodies kind of um encountering my 16 year old self and sort of trying to reconcile those those two aspects of myself yeah that's great um I think um before we we're gonna turn it over to you guys um for sure um I just have I have a few questions that I I'm personally like Isaiah is who plays Lawrence he is so incredible and I'm yeah. sure you've heard people singing his praises as, as well <laughs> of course um but one I, I'd love to hear I, I'd love to know like what the casting process was um because he is such a you know singular presence and just like I can't imagine I don't feel like I feel like <laughs> I really can't imagine the movie without him um but also kind of uh, well I'll let you answer that one first and then I have a follow-up oh yeah um yeah I mean I think Isaiah Lettinen is just a total genius and I'm so grateful that you know he was brought into my life and I got to work with him because you know the whole movie kind of rests on that actor's shoulders and you know it like he literally never stops talking. Um, you know, he has like 17 different monologues. The whole movie is basically a medium close up on his face. So it really has to be someone that, you know, you're going to go along on this ride with and and someone who's like really quite hard to love and, and you know, doesn't love himself. And, you know, it's a really hard one journey, I think, towards his, uh, you know, some kind of growth at the end. But like the character doesn't really change or become like a nicer more self-actualized person probably until the last 10 minutes of the movie so that's a that's a hard you know battle to win so I, I'm so lucky that I had such a charismatic you know interesting vulnerable complex actor like Isaiah but yeah we did this this casting wide a uh, Canada wide casting search um and you know over 300 actors kind of submitted self tapes and uh and, and yeah, it was really hard because, you know, it's such a specific role. And uh, and so he was one of the last people to audition. And as soon as I saw his tape, I was like, oh, my God, like this isn't how I was picturing this part. 
it's kind of I think in my head kind of picturing like Jason Schwartzman from Rushmore or something yeah. but but it was so much more interesting and fascinating and and the more that we talked and connected about you know movies and the things that he was interested in like the the, the better it got so I'm I'm really grateful to to have him as as the lead actor yeah he's he's so he's fantastic and um I mean, if you two are talking about movies, I mean, I'll just ask <laughs> what what is his favorite movie and what's your favorite movie? Um, his favorite movie, I think, is this film Perfect Blue. It's like an anime film. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's really into anime. <laughs> okay, cool. And then uh, my favorite film is Almost Famous by Cameron Crowe. Nice. And yeah, during the I made him kind of like a... for we just got some claps oh, for Almost Famous. So <laughs> nice, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but during kind of our prep, like I gave him sort of a, a list of movies to watch. Like there's a lot of movies. Um, and he is such a great, you know, student that he watched all of them. Um, and then we watched a couple films together. We watched uh, Shrek and uh, Shrek the Halls, the the Christmas movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, I think you, you touched on it a little bit. Um how you know it's it's very hard to love Lawrence or even you know just stand him for so much of the film but the the ending the those last 10 minutes are so beautiful and hopeful and it like it, it anytime I think about it, it gets me like a little emotional but like <laughs> I feel like one I feel like this film should be shown like on the first day of like cinema studies <laughs> like buddy because I feel like so many people kind of go into college like Lawrence throughout most of this film but <laughs> I, I, I like we you know we live in a very um I don't know if you folks are familiar with like letterboxd are you, okay uh, for for those who aren't familiar it's a it's a social media platform where people rate movies and review them and it kind of is filled with a lot of Lawrence's and I think in, you know, this day and age with a lot of people kind of being very toxic openly about film and the people who make films, I, I wonder, this might be a little too heavy, but I wonder if you think like, do you feel like this film has like a power to it? Because I feel like if we showed this film to the people that make filmmaking toxic and unenjoyable it could possibly like make a change I don't know I don't know <laughs> if that was like your thought going in and being like oh my god there's so many film bros and it's terrible out there like I, I don't know if you think there's like a healing power to this film in any way um yeah I mean I I think that that's that was sort of my intention to make the main character a young man and you know I think often female filmmakers don't really tell stories about men and there's something interesting about writing a male character maybe from a different angle than they can see themselves because I I feel like I've seen this movie like directed by Lawrence's like many times but there's something that's kind of cool about his journey actually being motivated by like the women in his life and mm -hmm. women actually being like calling him out for and and basically the message is like stop talking about movies like yeah yeah ask people questions like make room for other people's interests and not only is that the way you're going to maybe develop some actual human relationships in your life but I also feel like that's the key to being a great artist like if he is going to be a filmmaker down the road you know so much of that job is about human relationships and being kind and empathetic and understanding people's emotions and not trying to willfully assert you know your own dominance on on what you're trying to achieve when you're creating art um and and, and that is a really hard lesson to learn um so yeah I'm I'm hopeful I mean I yeah it'd be great to do some kind of clockwork orange like immersion therapy where we just <laughs> get a bunch of you know mid-30s uh men in in um Tarkovsky t-shirts and just kind of tape their eyes open and show them a few <laughs> uh but you know um yeah maybe maybe it'll scare somebody straight or um yeah or maybe i don't but maybe true lawrence is if you're a true lawrence i think you'd probably rate this movie like a two on letterbox <laughs> yeah i'm sure i'm sure 
<laughs> they don't like the truth. Um, <laughs> the, so I'm going to turn it over to you folks. If you have questions, um, speak up because I feel like I'm kind of deaf, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, in the back. Okay. Uh, uh, the questions about, I think when, when Matt leaves Lawrence kind of like high and dry, um when they when he wants to do rejects night again so is that like i, I think just the question is that was, yeah. was he was he intentionally leaving him like high and dry um yeah i think i think lawrence wasn't really like picking up on social cues there that uh, maybe matt didn't want to have a, a reunion and he was just trying to be nice and you know i think like all teenagers and, and just people in the world he wasn't so great at conflict and being like I don't want to be your friend anymore it's kind of a slow burn uh friendship breakup which I think is is very common but you know rarely portrayed on screen um yeah so I guess the beat when he um looks up his account because Matt stood him up he, he realizes he's he's actually started renting movies at another sequels <laughs> yeah. yeah so then you know I think he kind of gets the message that that Mac kind of doesn't want to have anything to do with him anymore, and that's why he sleeps overnight in the store because he's uh, he's a drama queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fantastic. All right. Um. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's that's a really good question. Uh. The question is the the film ends on a hopeful note, but was that always the goal? Like, were there other endings that maybe weren't so? hopeful like what what were your other possible endings for Lawrence um yeah I think that was that was kind of always the sort of grace note like I wanted to see him uh go to Carlton and kind of uh you know it's it, sometimes you don't get what you want but you sort of get what you need and I think he kind of needed to be like put in his place a little bit um not that there's anything wrong with uh Carlton University um <laughs> But uh, yeah, I like the idea of kind of finally seeing him off in college and, and that kind of beat of him, you know, asking the first person ever a question. <laughs> yeah. It's like so simple. And then, of course, he, he completely blows in and asks way too many questions. Um, but, you know, I, I'd be so fun to like, I, I have this like secret dream of kind of like revisiting this character maybe like five or ten years later and it'd be kind of fun to like do a sequel or watch him grow up and and find out what he's like in kind of his his late 20s or something or maybe again in his his 40s and I think that could be really interesting yeah it could be like a like a seven up series yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. they're like Antoine Duanel movies that like Truffaut did or yeah, kind yeah. of like before trilogy yeah I love that I I would see that. I mean, <laughs> um, anyone else? Because I have more questions. Because I love this. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like 2003, yeah. Uh, did you consider doing more with like the, the fact that 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 No, I, I I got you. Yeah, I I think I can consolidate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. So the question is, so the film takes place in two thousand three, correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, like, were were there elements of kind of two thousand three two thousand three early two thousands core that you wanted to include more of, or was like the idea to kind of make it set in 2003 but not go all in on like that early 2000s vibe was that like deliberate to kind of make it more like universal like uh i think we tried our best with our limited canadian micro budget to yeah. uh 
no, it did. No, it's the, yeah. the, the era. So uh, I'm sorry that it didn't work for you, but uh, you know, we we tried our best. Yeah, I, th I don't think it was like a, a ding. It was just like, <laughs> do you ever think of like adding like more to it? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. Well, you know, I think it's like all eras when you kind of express them cinematically, right? Like, even if you're living in 2003, you probably have that like old couch from the 90s that you never got rid of, right? Or yeah. people always kind of, you know, I think Lawrence is kind of sometimes wearing like his father's old clothes from the probably 80s or 90s after he passed away you know or um i think matt is is very uh appropriate to the era with his 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 outfits yeah. um and we tried to do our best to kind of uh have some elements like the old emac computers in the um library or uh you know that the, the picture vehicles um or just i guess the touches in the the video store i think also kind of trying to show 2003 as sort of this transition time like the time where like both vhs and dvd are in, in play great um yeah we got a question over here okay great so let me i just want to make sure i got it. so first off uh the the person that uh asked the question is from scarborough oh so. <gasps> no way <laughs> so we got some ontario representation here too oh my god um, that's amazing <laughs> um and the question's about alana and her story and was it and you can all you can correct me if i get this wrong but was that like was that her was her story always written that way and like where do you see her now like yeah oh yeah the like why why the original story about the suicide of the roommate Oh yeah. yeah. And where why did she, she go from here? Like in, in Oh yeah. Life. Why did she why did she lie about that to yeah. Lawrence? Um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean I, I love Romina who plays Alana. I think she's so fantastic. Um I guess I was thinking, I guess, with her story that there was something kind of nice, uh kind of as as a contrast to this kid who like utterly reveres and adores movies to kind of shed some light on like a personal story that's like this isn't what you think it is like you think it's like this incredibly gratifying amazing thing but actually the industry is really tough and here's my experience and I think she's like not really I think she's kind of confused like she's sort of like she says to, to Lawrence like I've given you so much power over me and you don't even like or uh I, I really want your approval and that's the like the saddest thing that I can imagine like there's something about Lawrence as a kid that's kind of like triggering her and sort of reminding of her, of her her trauma and then I think she lies to him because she doesn't obviously want to admit what really happened to her because they don't know each other very well and um, I think it's just kind of sad to admit to like this kid who probably reminds her in some ways of herself and also is going off to university and is so sure of this future that he's gonna have that She's like, yeah, I used to be like artistic and ambitious and talented. And, and now I'm, you know, managing this this video store. And um, that could be his future for him also, or or it could not. And I think there's a lot of a lot of people that are really talented that for whatever reason, you know, their artistic ambitions or dreams like don't work out for them. And I like the idea of these these people that are sort of both super traumatized and dealing with pain and and things that they haven't worked out and in a weird way they they sort of form this very complicated strange friendship um for a very small <laughs> period of time mm -hmm. but i don't know i mean i i really hope the best for her i i really i'm rooting for all the characters in the movie uh it'd be so great if um maybe she did like uh she joined the cast of uh you know, working moms or something for, for a season. Uh, um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I hope that she, she comes back to acting in a way that feels like fun and, and pure for her. And she can kind of recapture that, that love of performing. Um, and, and, and maybe, um, and I, I think therapy is going to be really good for her. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if any, does anyone else have a question? Cause because I have one. <laughs> um, and then I think we might 
wrap up unless anyone has one more question. So think about it maybe. Um, well, <laughs> I'm, that's, that's, um, so the the scene where um, where they show um, where Lauren and Matt show the end of the school year mm -hmm. film. Um, I think it's very interesting how in the last couple of years, there's been your film and the Fablemans. Yeah. You have very, like the, the apex of the film basically and like the character like arc happens at the screening of an end of the year oh. film. And like I think like I I just think that's interesting. <laughs> but my my question more is what what was the process of making that film? Because it has a more kind of like dreamlike feeling to it. Like like were there other people direct like filming it like were there other people kind of helping out in the process that made it feel different like I'd love to know like what that process was like yeah well it's it is so funny because both the Fablemans and my film <laughs> premiered at TIFF um yeah. the same year and it was so weird because people would do these like double bills of them <laughs> and then and, and and Isaiah started calling uh I like movies he's like it's like the red-pilled Fablemans like there's a lot of similar plot points like they're both about like young boys with who are dealing with trauma that they want to be filmmakers and uh you know there's a year at video scene there's a there's a panic attack sequence you know there's there's a lot of similarities and uh gabriel labelle who is the star of the film is actually auditioned for i like movies because he's canadian really yeah and that's i saw his audition. that's fascinating I was, I was like i don't see it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. He, he did other he did other stuff yeah he's, like, you know <laughs> um yeah because he's from Vancouver um but yeah I think you know it's interesting I feel like after the pandemic you know like uh, when we when we all couldn't go to the movies for like two or three years there was something I think about the kind of nostalgia of that and like filmmakers kind of looking back on their past and sort of taking stock of things and kind of remembering their childhoods and stuff. So I, I feel like that's why there's been this kind of through line between some of these movies, like Empire of Light is another one. There, yeah, there's been a lot of kind of like magic of cinema movies. Yeah. And I feel like my, maybe Fablemans is like, you know, expectations in my films, like reality. <laughs> like you don't always get that like meeting with like John Wayne in the director's office. Sometimes you're just rewinding VHS tapes um, at sequels. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in, in answer to your other question about the year in video, um, yeah, my vision for that was like, I really wanted it to feel like if Sofia Coppola had like directed her year in video and she was like 16 and it was really important to me to shoot it on 16 millimeter film. Um, yeah, I, I did direct it, um, but I worked with a different cinematographer, uh, this woman, Kareen Zahner, who was very, very talented. And, uh, you know, we recruited like a cast of like a like, group of high school students that were all in the same drama club and, you know, uh, again, I think it was another um, wave of the pandemic. I think it was Omicron. So again, it was kind of a hectic shoot just to kind of arrange it. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, it was fun to like stage that kind of prom scene and and just like I really wanted to have this kind of different authenticity to it and and visual language and and really feel authentically like a a sixteen year old who's who's talented and you know has an eye, but like you know it's still a little bit like more um, intimate and kind of amateurish but you can see the like raw talent behind it yeah yeah it's such a it's such a beautiful moment too um thank you yeah um any other questions before we wrap up tonight oh one more okay um i'm just gonna plug in my phone i'm still here but i'm just gonna stop my video for one second so you don't have to see uh, how messy my apartment is okay but i'm still here <laughs> okay Great. The, the, the question is more of a comment. It's just um, how fantastic the scene between the corporate representative, Lana, and Lawrence is in that kind of one of those, one like that scene towards the end. Um, um, I guess we can follow up with that and just be like, what was that like? Because that's really like the kind of blow up of everything um, whenever you're ready to answer. I thought, oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I, I feel like um, 
you know, the secret weapon of this, that scene is this fantastic actor, Dan Byrne, who's kind of like this amazing uh, Canadian comedian and, and actor who I've, I've been friends with for many years. And he's been in a lot of really great movies. Um, he's in the new Sofia Coppola movie actually right now, Priscilla. Oh. Um, but yeah, I think the, it was so fun to kind of think about this concept for a scene of like sort of a HR meeting that goes completely off the rails yeah. and, 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 and kind of to see Alana who's been sort of, you know, relative, you know, obviously raising some red flags in terms of professionalism, but, but, you know, I think like a good, good boss and like cares about her job and like, yeah, you know just completely losing it on this kid and yeah. uh and then kind of this this the hr rep who's trying to kind of like tow this corporate line and so yeah there was a lot of fun ad libs and kind of ideas and i love when he's like uh you know uh he's like my dad been suicide he's like well on behalf of the sequels corporation i like to extend my deepest <laughs> um i mean it was it was pretty similar to i guess how it was written on the page but i think just the sort of um, genius of all those actors together. Um, it just made it so much more uh, better um, than I than I could have ever imagined. And I, I feel really grateful that uh, that it turned out the way it did. And a lot of it is also the real genius of my editor too, Simone Smith, who's like just incredible with like kind of finding like the rhythm and timing of the scenes and, and you know, performances and stuff. Just a, a lot of what's amazing about the movie is really, really, she was such an invaluable part of helping me find kind of the tone and the spirit of the comedy. Great. Um, great. I, I think, oh, we got one more. Okay, let's keep it going. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the question is, why why did you choose for your first film to do a coming of age story? I think there was also a, a, a comparison yeah, yeah, yeah. No, a compliment. But yeah, um, like, and also kind of bringing up that Greta Gerwig's first director directorial film was or directorial feature was Lady Bird. So, like, what do you why what drew you to coming of age as the kind of subgenre that you wanted to tackle first? And what do you think draw? It seems like a lot like a when people make their first not many people, but you know, like when people people are kind of gravitated towards coming of age when they're making their first film. So if you want to speak to that as well. Yeah, that's that's an amazing question. Um, I love Lady Bird so much. Uh, it's one of my all time favorite movies and Greta Gerwig's, you know, total hero of mine. And uh, I think I saw somebody once said that they they called the film like uh, Lady Bird for Losers. And that was like the best compliment <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think for me, like coming of age films are like my favorite genre, you know, especially coming of age comedies like uh, Fast Times Rich Run High or, or Say Anything. Like those films are very, very dear to my heart. And I think working at Blockbuster, I mean, that's like that was like my diet of movies. Like I would all I would do is just sit in the back room of Blockbuster and watch coming of age movies. And so, um, yeah, I, I think for a lot of filmmakers, there's something about um I guess trying to figure out how to tell your own story and I guess when you're you know making your debut feature the most kind of prescient and primal memories you have are probably of your adolescence um, or childhood so they feel kind of intimate and familiar but there's probably still that distance um, that allows you to be able to tell the story it, I guess it's hard to kind of talk about your experiences as you're experiencing them um but um you know um yeah I, I, and it's weird because it's there's there's so many movies that are coming of age films you know through different lenses but then there's also kind of these archetypes of like what a coming of age movie is supposed to be um but i think it's a genre that even if i move into uh my films about my my 20s or my 30s or my 40s they'll, they'll still all be becoming of age movies um and uh, I, I always think it's amazing to just kind of watch people go on a journey and learn incredibly hard lessons the completely wrong way and, and kind of um, really try and fail to grow up. And um, yeah, and, and I love that. Yeah, 
I, I love that too. I think we all really <laughs> connected with the film and really are, we're, we're so happy that we could present this film and we could have this conversation with you, Chandler. Um, oh, wonderful questions too. And I, I really appreciate the chance to, to be here tonight and thank you all for, for watching it and, and engaging with it. Yeah. All right. Oh, one, one more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, the, the last question that we have here is, is, um, is why, why did you choose to, oh, well, you actually touched on this a little bit, actually. So, but um, the, the question was, why, why did you decide to write a character that was male when it's from, from your, you know, based off of your life? But I think we touched on that. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll just add that if I if the main character was a young woman, the the Lady Bird comparisons would would never end, and uh, she did it better. So yeah. <laughs> that way, I could I could rip I could wholeheartedly rip it off, and and no one would be the the wiser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll keep that our secret though. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't tell anyone. Yeah, it doesn't leave Boston. It's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Chandler, thank you so much for your film, for being here. And thank you all of you for sticking around for the great questions and for watching this movie. Tell everybody about it. Please. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great night. Good night. All right. Bye. Bye.